Hey guys, in today's video I'm going to be starting a new series where I'll be discussing the history of smaller teams in Formula 1 history. This continues on from a video I made about a month ago talking about some of the worst teams to have graced our sport. It will be a semi-regular series I intend to upload once a week alongside my regular uploading schedule. The first instalment of this series will be about a very small Italian team that raced in F1 for a full decade but didn't have much success. With that being said, let's get into the video. The team started its racing journey in 1965 when Enzo Acella, a former rally driver, began racing Fiat Abarths in Italian local and regional series. After a decade or so of piddling about in souped up Cinquecentos, Acella took over the running of the Works Abarth sports car team in 1974. A seller expanded the team's exploits into single-seater racing for 1975, specifically the Formula 2 series, which had previously been won by Grand Prix legends such as Jackie Ix, Clay Regazzoni and Ronnie Peterson. Admittedly by 1975, most major manufacturers and drivers had pulled out of the second tier series, so competition was less fierce. This meant that the two-car operation ran by a seller in 1975 would get the best result of three fourth places courtesy of Giorgio Francia in Estoril, Hockenheim and Mugello. Francia claimed joint 7th place in the driver's standings, tied with the man whose last name sounds like a cartoon trampoline, but we'll just call him Claude. Francia's Acela teammate, Duilio Truffo, scored 4 5th places and 2 6th places to finish joint 11th in the championship, tied with future Tolman driver, Brian Henton. Private entries of the FA2 chassis were also run by Roberto Filanino and ex-Ferrari F1 driver Arturo Mezzario late in the season. The chassis became uncompetitive post-1975, however, and after competing in the first few rounds of the 1976 F2 season, only finishing one out of six races, Osella pulled out of the series. They concentrated on local Italian races again, before returning to the Formula 2 scene in 1979, with a singular FA2 chassis piloted by American Eddie Chiva. He won three races during the season in Silverstone, Poe and Zandvoort, but got no other podium finishes, and thus finished fourth in the driver's standings behind Mark Shearer, the aforementioned Henton and Derek Daly. After an impressive, although inconsistent campaign, Enzo Acella thought it would be a great idea to make the step up from Formula 2 to Formula 1 for 1980, having acquired sponsorship money from an Italian tobacco company. The team brought their driver Chiva up to F1 with them, sporting a blue and white livery inspired by another sponsor in the form of denim jeans. It's maybe a shame then that the newly christened FA1 chassis absolutely ripped on track, and not in a good way. Chiva failed to qualify for four of the opening six races of the season, only making it onto the grid in Kailami and Long Beach. He coincidentally qualified for exactly 3.83 seconds off pole position in both races, and retired within 11 laps of both races, spinning out in South Africa and having transmission issues in the United States. After the sixth race in Monaco, however, Chiva qualified for every remaining race in the season. Despite qualifying for all the events, the car was chronically unreliable and only finished one of the remaining eight races on the calendar all of which retirements were mechanically inclined. The sole standout finish came in the team's home race in the Italian Grand Prix, where the car qualified 17th and finished 12th and last of the cars still remaining at the track's debut race. After a slow start in 1980, it's safe to say Acela became frantic heading into 1981. As they expanded to two cars, which were B-spec chassis of the previous year's car, Chiva left the Acela team to join Tyrrell, and in his place, the team signed Beppe Gabbiani and Miguel Angel Guerra. The opening four races of the year saw Gabbiani qualify for only two of them, and Guerra for only one. Gabbiani was 24th in qualifying at the season opening USGP West at Long Beach before retiring on lap 26 due to an accident. Both cars qualified for the fourth race of the season in Imola, with Gabbiani 20th and Guerra in 22nd. Guerra crashed out on the opening lap, breaking his wrist and his ankle, while Gabbiani crashed out on lap 31. Guerra was replaced for two races at Zolder and Monaco by Piercarlo Ginzani, and both he and his teammate Gabbiani qualified in Zolder, with the former in 24th and the latter in 22nd. Ginzani finished a seller's second race ever, while his teammate suffered engine failure in the actual race. Ginzani was then replaced by the main driver from a seller's first F2 season, Giorgio Francia. He was one and a half seconds off his teammate Gabbiani in qualifying for the Spanish Grand Prix, and neither were able to qualify. After running a one-car team at the French Grand Prix, Acela hired three-time F1 podium finisher and pole sitter Jean-Pierre Jarrier. Results instantly picked up, as although Gabbiani failed to qualify for every remaining race, Jarrier not only qualified for every single event, but scored four top ten finishes. Two consecutive eighth-place finishes in Silverstone and Hockenheim were followed by a tenth place at the Oesterreichring and ninth of the team's home race in Monza. 
These were clearly small baby steps to round off 1981 as Atala aimed to be a better and more reliable and fast team moving forward. 1982 saw the team retain Jarier and sign a European Formula 2 driver, the 23 year old Riccardo Paletti. Jarier qualified for all of the first three races of the season, finishing 9th in Yaka Paragua after qualifying 23rd. He retired in Kyle Army and Long Beach, even as he qualified an astonishing 10th in the American race on the West Coast. Paletti struggled, however, failing to qualify for any of the first three races of the season. The fourth race in Imola, however, was different. As a proponent of the Fisa Foca War, many teams boycotted the San Marinese race, with Acela being one of only seven teams who turned up. Jarier qualified 9th out of 14 cars, with Paletti in 13th. Unfortunately, Paletti's first start ended in retirement on lap 7. However, Jarier made it to the end of a race only 5 cars finished, in 4th place, thus scoring Acela's first ever points. After the high of scoring three points at one of their home tracks, the team failed to reach the end of all of the next three races with both cars, in Zolder, Monaco and Detroit. Canada was up next, only the third race of the season both Acela team cars had qualified for. Jarier was 18th on the grid, and Paletti was 23rd. At the start of the race, Didier Peroni stalled his car from pole position, and all the cars behind him swerved to avoid the parked Ferrari. After a few drivers clipped a stopped car and spun, Paletti was unsighted and ran straight into the back of Peroni's car at 110 miles an hour or 180 kilometers per hour. Paletti had suffered severe chest injuries and was wedged against the steering wheel as a result of a crash. Peroni and the late Professor Sid Watkins were on the scene within seconds to assist the Acela driver to escape. As Watkins climbed over the car, the fuel in the car ignited and enveloped the wreckage in flames, trapping a wounded Paletti inside. Once they put the fire out, the Italian driver had no pulse. It took 25 minutes to get him out of the car by cutting the car apart around him. He was flown to a local hospital, but was pronounced dead soon after arrival. Paletti's death was the last in an F1 Grand Prix weekend until Roland Ratzenberger died in qualifying for the 1994 San Marino Grand Prix. Jarier withdrew from the race out of respect for his fallen teammate, and thus Acela had their worst race weekend in their history. They didn't hire a replacement for Paletti for the rest of the season, and Jarier didn't have the best season after that. He only finished one race in the rest of the season, where he got 14th in Zandvoort, and he even failed to qualify in Austria. He also failed to start the final race of the season in Caesars Palace. After a tragic 1982 season, Jarier was dropped for 1983, and the team opted for an all Italian lineup of Corrado Fabi, Teo's brother, and Pierre Carlo Ginzani, who did two races for Acela in 1981. However, the team didn't finish any races until the 11th round in Austria, where Fabi was 10th and Ginzani was 11th. Another 11th place in Zandvoort from Fabio was the only other finish for a seller that season. A 10% finishing rate isn't great, but the team were looking to 1984, their first full season with Alfa Romeo engines. They also downsized to a one-car operation driven by Pierre Carlo Ginzani for the first portion of the year. He had a smattering of retirements and failures to qualify as usual, but he finished 12th in Dijon, 7th in Monaco, and then 5th in the only ever Dallas Grand Prix, getting the Acela team's second ever points finish. He followed this up with 9th in Brantach, the 10th race of the season, which was the first race where they ran a second car. Austrian Joe Gartner came in for the final 7 races of the season and finished 5th in Monza with Ginzani 7th, which should have been a seller's third ever points finish. However, the team had only entered one car into the Constructors Championship at the start of the season, so Gartner's second entry was basically ignored in the eyes of the organising body. To put a comparison, it's like when F2 cars used to enter F1 races in the 50s and 60s to bolster grid numbers, but they weren't eligible for points even if they finished in the top 6. Acela finished the season 12th in the Constructors' Championship on 2 points, and went into 1985 and still running a one-car entry. Ginzani stayed with the team into the new season, and finished 3 of the first 8 races of the season, with 12th in Yaka Paragua, 9th in Estoril, and 15th in Paul Ricard. Then after the race in Silverstone, Ginzani was replaced by Dutch driver Ub Rottengata for the rest of the season. He achieved best results of 9th in Austria and 7th in the last race of the season in Adelaide. The team went back to a two-car operation for 1986, re-signing Ginzani and hiring German driver Christian Danner in the second car. Both drivers failed to finish in all of the first three races of the season, having engine failures in the first two races, then at the third race of the season in San Marino, Danner suffered from engine failure, while Ginzani ran out of fuel on lap 52. Monaco saw both Acelas fail to qualify, then at Spa and Montreal, both cars retired, with a double engine failure coming in the former and gearbox and turbo failure coming in the latter. Canadian driver Alan Berg then took over Dana's seat from the next race in Detroit onwards. 
Another three double retirements followed in Detroit, Paul Ricard and Brands Hatch. Then Berg scored the team's first finish of the season in Hockenheim with 12th place. Both of Salah cars retired with suspension issues in the inaugural Hungarian Grand Prix, then Ginzani got 11th place in Austria. Alex Caffey took over Berg's seat in Monza, however was unclassified during the race, then Berg returned for the final three races of the season, finishing 13th in Estoril, 16th in Mexico, and unclassified in Adelaide after being 21 laps down at the chequered flag. A 12.5% finishing rate, and no top 10s, probably forced the team, downsize again, to only one full-time car for 1987. Alex Caffey was signed on, but embarrassingly retired for the season opener in Yacaparagua due to exhaustion. He was joined by a second chassis driven by Gabriele Tarquini in round 2 in Imola, where Caffey finished 12th. Then Caffey retired from the next 10 races in a row. Yes, that's 10 consecutive mechanical retirements. In Monza, Estoril and Jerez, a seller ran a second car driven by the Swiss Franco Farini, although he retired from the first two events and didn't qualify for Jerez. Caffey also didn't qualify in Spain, which technically broke his 10 race retirement streak, then he retired in Mexico and Suzuka before failing to qualify again in Adelaide. The finishing rate more than halved from the previous year, with Acela finishing only 5% of races entered in 1987. Caffey left the team for 1988 and was replaced by future Ferrari driver Nicola Larini. Something to note for 1988 was the name of the Acela chassis. Since 1981, the team used chassis that had the acronym FA1, then a letter to denote a newer spec car. So it went through the alphabet, FA1B, FA1C, FA1D, FA1E, and so on and so forth. In 1988, the chassis was called the FA1L. This detail may seem irrelevant, but when written out, FA1L looks like you are spelling out the word fail. Even the team thought the car was dog shit then, if they wanted to call it the fail. After failing to qualify in Yacaparagua, Larini was excluded from the weekend in Imola. The car finished its first race in Monaco in ninth place, but then proceeded not to qualify in Mexico and Canada, before retiring in Detroit and Paul Ricard. Larini was classified 19th in Silverstone after running out of fuel with five laps left, then retired in Hockenheim, failed to pre-qualify in Hungary, then retired again in both Spa and Monza. A 12th place in Estoril was followed by two retirements in Jerez and Suzuka before failing to pre-qualify again in the last race of the season in Adelaide. After improving their record, even getting a top 10, the team expanded to two cars for 1989 and re-signed Piercarlo Ginzani for his fourth different stint with the team. If you think Fernando Alonso had a love affair with the Enstone-based F1 team Renault slash Alpine, or like Jean-Pierre Jarier did with Ligier, or like James Hunt did with Cigarettes and Sex, then Ginzani was a different breed of loyal. Larini was disqualified in Brazil, the season opener, for an illegal start, while Ginzani failed to pre-qualify. Larini finished 12th in Imola, but then after that the team only made four starts in the next nine races with either car, with Larini qualifying three times to Ginzani's once. Then, for the last three races of the season, Larini qualified for all of them, with Ginzani qualifying for two. However, they retired from all of those races. A finishing rate of just 3% was a new low for the fledgling team, and they downsized again to a one-car operation in 1990, driven by F3000 driver Olivier Grouillard. The original team owner, Enzo Acela, also sold the team to the owner of a company called Fond Metal, but the team continued as Acela into 1990. Coyard retired from the first three races of the season in Phoenix, Brazil and Imola, then failed to qualify in Monaco. 13th in Montreal was followed by 19th in Mexico, then Coyard failed to pre-qualify in Paul Ricard, then failed to qualify in both Britain and Germany. A failure to pre-qualify in Hungary was followed by 16th in Spa, a retirement in Monza and a DNQ in Estoril and a retirement in Jerez. The team rounded out the season with another DNQ in Suzuka, then 13th in Adelaide. Then, after 1990, the team was renamed to Fond Metal for 1991, and thus, a seller was out of Formula 1. They survived 11 seasons, even if they never achieved much success at all. They scored 5 points over 11 seasons, courtesy of a 4th place from Jean-Pierre Jarier in 1982, and a 5th place for Pierre Carlo Ginzani in 1984. The team was completely cash-strapped for most of its F1 tenure, but still pulled through until its dignified demise. They may have been awful, especially with Alfa Romeo engines blowing up every 5 seconds, but they were plucky underdogs who achieved their dream of racing in Formula 1, which so many people want to achieve. Thus, I think this is a really cool story. Anyways, with that being said, that's the end of the video. I hope you enjoyed the start of a new series on this channel looking at small and unknown teams, and give me some ideas in the comments who I should cover next. Remember to like, and subscribe and follow me on Instagram and Patreon to see behind the scenes content.
I will leave the links in the description. I've been Nedzo, and I'll see you all later. Bye!